again the world hears the thunder of war. But Korea was to be no back alley battle, no local conflict headlined one day and forgotten the next. This time it involved the world. The present situation is a serious one and is a threat to international peace. This time through the United Nations, the world acted. The United States, Turkey, the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, 38 member countries all rushed men and equipment to support the South Korean army. Korea was a country little known by the world in 1945, a country which had for three generations been under Japanese domination. The Allied troops who came then were welcomed as liberators. Now the Korean people would have their own flag and sing their own anthems. But who noticed in those days of joy that a line was being drawn across the map of their country. The 38th parallel was only a military expedient, a way for the Russian and American forces to occupy Korea while the Japanese were being disarmed. But the temporary boundary blocked the country's growth, made uncertain the supply of hydropower from the north, stopped the free flow of its people. The boundary became a fixed barrier which no conference could erase. Even the United Nations Commission established in 1947 was not allowed to cross it. Thus, UN-sponsored elections could be held only in the South. The Republic of Korea was proclaimed and the United States Army of Occupation withdrew. In the north, the Russian forces left, and a government called the Democratic People's Republic of Korea was in power. The 38th parallel was no longer a border. It was a deep chasm between two halves of one country. Elsewhere, all Asian peoples were fired by the democratic vision of Mahatma Gandhi. In every country rang the cries for independence. Freed from the ties of colonial empires, Asia's destiny was now her own. This was no sudden rising. Half a century of struggle lay behind the hard-won liberties. Seven hundred millions in India, in Burma, Indonesia, Pakistan, in Ceylon, and in the Philippines proclaimed constitutions based on the nobility of their own culture, rooted in the needs of their own people. Today, the new leaders of Asia, like Sukarno of Indonesia and Nehru of India, guide their countries through the problems of nationhood. At the same time, these leaders face the task of explaining the East to the West. Postcard impressions. The West knew little else. Here were ancient cultures, religions whose followers were numbered in the hundreds of millions. And these religions gave to everyday life the power and grace of art. But contact with the West had stirred Asia. 
Kings and merchants sent sons to Europe and America to study Western ways. Fumifan al-Duldit, King Rama IX of Siam, was born in the United States while his father studied medicine at Harvard. In other ways, too, Asia was feeling Western influences. In the port cities, Bangkok, Shanghai, the high-gear techniques of the West merged with the skipping clatter of the rickshaw. From the few glimpses Asian people had of the West, they discovered there was another kind of life which provided even more than food and shelter. Yet, in the stretching hinterlands of Asia, in the countless provinces and villages and valleys, the severe life of the people remained unchanged. But change came. Men who for centuries were fed only on the terrible certainties of hunger and the desperate uncertainty of the seasons boiled with unrest, ready to seize any means in the attempt to find a better life. Under the banners of freedom and nationalism, there were groups to whom violence became an end. They created the chaos which threatened to shatter the hopes of Asia. The way of the East, Gandhi had said, is the way of non-violence and love. This must Asia teach the West. In the vicious riots for freedom and independence, it seemed that the Orient had ignored Gandhi's message. Yet at New Delhi, in the historic splendor of the Purana Gila, the All-Asia Conference of 1947 saw the nations of the Orient come together to seek a peaceful and common ground for the advance of their continent. This was no ordinary gathering. Such a conference had never before taken place in the history of the Orient. Here, for the first time, representatives of two-thirds of the world's people shook hands and exchanged greetings long overdue. Despite all differences of race, language, religion, and industrial development, there was the feeling that the countries of Asia had entered a new era, one in which they would play increasingly a more important role in world affairs. Then the hopes of Asia were raised by the signs of friendship shown by many Western countries. The Commonwealth ministers meeting in Ceylon recognized the urgency of Asian needs. Theirs and the many programs of the United Nations made the development of Asia a matter for world action. Canada's Lester Pearson pointed out the challenge of our day. We in the West, he said, must provide some real satisfaction for those everlasting hungers for bread, security and freedom to which the communists pretend to cater. Otherwise, we shall not secure the support of those in many parts of the world, and particularly in Asia, on whose cooperation we must rely in the days ahead. The most basic and urgent want is food, needed in every corner of Asia. Some cry, give the land to the people. Let those who labor reap the harvest. But others say, land reform is not enough when the land itself is old and arid. They need fertilizer, tractors, and Western know-how. While still others ask for schools and textbooks, the West knows that the real solutions lie with the peoples of Asia themselves. Today, Asia's colorful pageantry is more than just an echo of the past. We in Asia, said Prime Minister Nehru, are a generation chained to hard labor. At the same time, we have the splendid task of building on strong foundations new and free nations to work for humanity, both in the East and in the West.